turning my mic on. Okay. Yes, hello, there we are. The mic microphones are on. Um, a, um, a warm welcome and uh, from Bristol, uh, from the University of West of England Centre for Fine Print Research. Welcome to B. Haynes and all our uh, participants and viewers today. Um, just to say, just a bit of householding, just to say that we are recording this session. And there, on the right hand side, there is a chat, a chat function. So we will be monitoring the chat function. Uh, if you want to uh, ask some questions, um, like, please feel free to put some in the chat or the Q and A. I shall have a look at these afterwards. Um, we are uh, going to do this seminar for about half an hour, including some Q and As, which Laura Clark Oden has uh, um, volunteered to to conduct with me at the, uh, afterwards. And uh, yeah, so just uh, for me to say thank you again for being to um, volunteer and, and offer uh, an insight into her, her work. Okay, so I shall put my, turn my camera off and uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Okay, is that working? Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Bea Haynes and I am a visual artist. And today I wanted to really talk about um, my research in forensic science in relation to printmaking um, and including my residency in a forensic lab and how the forensics of everyday life informs my artistic practice. Um, so I wanted to start by showing you um, an early large scale drawing. Um, when my grandmother died, I became fascinated by the many cherished possessions that she'd left behind um, and each object acquired a poignancy that had previously not existed. Um, although void of life, her house took on the role of like a museum of personal antiquities and a proof of her existence. And so I wanted to record as many traces and objects as I could that were left behind, things like um, strands of hair left in her comb and um, uh, Im imprints on the carpet and tea stains on, on mugs and things. And since this experience, my artwork has been really heavily influenced by traces. Although the human is often absent in the artwork, um, the object left behind leaves a kind of anthropomorphic portrait that like forensic evidence tells a story. So um, this piece of artwork was, as I say, a large scale drawing of a section of my grandmother's carpet where she used to get ready um, every day for, for the day and brush her hair, etc. On the right hand side, on the right hand side, you can see. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, um, right. Ask a very quick a favor. Could you click on hide so that we don't see the uh, sharing your screen message over your beautiful? Oh, screen. oh yes, of course. Sorry, Thank I didn't you. see that. That's Thank great. you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, so yeah, this piece of artwork is a section of my grandmother's carpet, and. Um, uh, the, so you can see on the right hand side the kind of indentations where the um, stool used to sit in the carpet and then on the um, left hand side you can see um, the horizontal lines where her feet used to kind of scuff the carpet and indent on the carpet. So I, I could really feel my grandmother's presence uh, through this image and through this object uh, despite the fact that she was gone because uh, the weight of her was kind of still felt. She had imprinted herself um, upon this carpet. And this is when my practice really began to change and be much more involved with printmaking. Um, this is a similar um, project in a way um, in terms of the presence of somebody being left behind after they are gone. Um, I made hundreds of rubbings of overbed from overbed tables from um, a school medical center where I was actually doing a residency um, at the time. Um, and it, the students who had been sickly in this school sanatorium had left hundreds of graffiti captions behind um, by scraping into the surface of these wooden tables that used to sit over them uh, that they could eat from when they were in bed. And many of these messages referred to the students' ailments um, uh, as you can see with this one, um, it says months uh, 1935 ERAC and B2, which was the name of their um, house they were in at school. Um, and the symbol in the middle actually is also the symbol of their house. So there's a lot of information left behind 
in the surface of, of these um, tables. And I actually did rubbings of every single table, top and bottom, um, as well uh, for this piece called Bedstones. Um, and I think, I think a lot of the reason that they used to leave marks on the underside is because then they would evade the teachers. Um, but then, you know, some of them had left their names there. So it's very easy to trace who had left those marks behind. Um, but I'm interested in recording the topography of surface um, and also in how reading uh, into topography and how you can um, try and get a sense of, of you know the human condition from these marks left behind some of them were quite emotional and some of them were quite humorous one of them said like like this table i'm in with a broken leg um, and things like that so it really highlighted the human condition um, these are some casts i made of the original tables installed as part of a solo show um, each table represents one student who had died um, in the sanatorium at the school uh, throughout history um, and I'm really interested in the power of the multiple and how this can give the viewer a feeling of being overwhelmed and like the artwork is somehow taking over. Multiples work in two ways within my artwork. They can make something seem really beautiful, like a natural phenomena is occurring in a seemingly uh, domestic or mundane environment. Um, but they can also act the multiple can also be very abject and threatening, like a swarm of locusts, um, or disgusting, um, like like a fridge full of tongues. Uh, but there is also a link between multiples in printmaking and scientific testing, which are, which often involves painstakingly repeating a process over and over again. Um, I'm really interested in printmaking because print itself. Um, I feel relates so directly to the world. At its most basic level, it's about objects touching each other, coming into contact with, with each other. And this ties in really well with the basic principle of forensic science, which is every contact leaves a trace. Um, I, I really, I'm really interested in print because it is, because it's in and about the world. Um, and as you'll come to find, I take a very, very broad uh, view on printmaking. Um, so this artwork was a piece that I created during a forensic residency at the University of Abate in Dundee in their forensic lab, um, working alongside Dr. Kevin Faruja. And um, that was part of the um, printmaking, International Printmaking Conference, conference Impact 8. Um, and I, at the time, I wanted to collect a little um, things that had been left behind in the environment in Dundee or uh, to, to kind of look at Dundee in a, in a forensic way basically but um, to make things seem a bit more human as well um, objects that have been discarded and looking at you know trying to imagine perhaps why they've been discarded so this was um, a ball that I, I meticulously took apart and I applied a substance called dipyridyl to it, which is a forensic dye, which causes mud to turn pink. Um, and then I printed this on, uh, put this through a press basically and printed it onto a piece of paper. I really like to use unusual materials um, in the creation of artwork. And I like to believe that everything is up for grabs and that you can use anything as an art material. Um, most of forensic science um, that I've been involved with in, in relation to print anyway, is actually to do with better visualization. So most of the artworks you'll see that are to do with forensics in, in this presentation, it's, it's simply to do with making something easier to see in a tricky environment. So if you imagine um, you have a dark leatherette sofa and a crime has been committed on the sofa where somebody has bled on the sofa, often the blood once it's been there a while kind of dries a, a bit of a darker color than you imagine blood to be so it often goes kind of dark like a carmine color almost or um, like a, a bit brownie which which makes it very difficult to to see on on a dark leatherette sofa for example um, and so uh, in forensic science um, they will then apply um, lots of inks to this or, uh, or perhaps even fingerprint powders if you're looking at a print um, that's um, in, in sweat uh, so that they can better visualize things. 
Um, sometimes I aim in my work to find and showcase existing traces uh, that express something about human life or death, like this artwork where chewing gum was collected from the unders underside of school desks, cast into bronze and then placed back underneath the desks like little pieces of treasure for the students to find. And sometimes I actually myself fabricate traces um, to create the artwork. Um, so this, this is actually uh, two different artworks. The one on the right hand side is called Ecrine. So this is um, part of, again, part of the forensics residency I did. And I lived in this room for a week during the residency, used all of the objects, slept in the beds, um, and at the end of the week, I then treated those objects with a forensic dye called Basic Yellow 40, which is, this is getting very geeky now, guys, <laughs> um, which is a dye that you use to better visualize uh, prints in sweat. Um, and often it's latent prints, which means that um, it's a, a, an old print, basically. And actually the dye, um, the dyes in forensics often work better um, if the print is not so fresh and new, they work better if they're a bit older. Um, so visitors, visitors to this exhibition actually had to go into the space, don specialist goggles and a torch in order to see the artwork, um, which otherwise would have been invisible. And um, I, I suppose at the time I was really thinking about our use and abuse of everyday objects and how much we touch things without even realising it. Um, and I think with COVID now, actually, that's something that is much more in our minds and we're you know we're thinking on a daily basis of you know who how many people have touched that door door handle um but back back when i made this piece uh you didn't really think about that very much um so it gave people an idea of how much you might touch things um, and i'm also i'm really excited actually when there's a crossover between materials used in art and materials used in science and specifically forensic science so um, for example, charcoal or, or carbon is often used a lot in fingerprinting powders um, and it's just often mixed with some uh, ma magnetic filings. Um, silicon and sellotape are used a great deal in actually lifting, lifting fingerprints up. Um, and for this piece, for Ecrine, um, I actually used a super glue, an evaporated super glue in a fume cabinet because the basic yellow 40 dye would not um, adhere directly to the sweaty prints. Um, you, had to, you had to add a very, very fine mist of super glue on, which would adhere to the prints first. So you would hang up all of your objects like on, on a washing line almost inside this fume cupboard. Um, and once the super glue had dried, then you would apply the dye. Um, so here actually is, is an image of um, the telephone from that installation in um, a, a bath of the basic yellow 40 dye, just processing there. Um, in forensics, everyday objects are treated with both a sense of respect and care and a sterile objectiveness. People's clothing, hair and personal possessions are poked, dyed, gassed, swabbed, dissected, sprayed and cut. And um, the emotional weight of these objects can really fade as the necessary scientific processes prevails. At its most basic level, my work aims to make the viewer feel more emotional about everyday objects that are usually overlooked or perceived as mundane. Um, and I find this subversion of the domestic really interesting. In forensics, um, innocent objects can be made accomplices to murder and other crimes. Something as simple as a frying pan can become sinister against its own will or design. This is an image from a blood spatter analysis course that I did at King's College in London. Um, so this piece um, is called Acid Yellow 7, um, after the forensic dye used to create it. Um, again, this was heavily inspired by the forensics residency I did and the work of Dr. Kevin Farija. Um, however, I made this piece a few years later, actually. Um, instead of glowing sweat, though, this artwork um, actually glows, uh, causes blood to glow, uh, this acid yellowy colour. So you can better visualise it again on, on dark surfaces. 
Um, so this scene um, is what you would see if a bloody meal complete with steaks and blood soup had been eaten. And using forensic dyes and lighting, the crime scene is from the view of an animal having been murdered eaten, and, and eaten, um, question, questioning our use of animal products for consumption. Um, the viewer, again, would have to don goggles and a torch um, in, in able, uh, to be able to actually see the blood glowing yellow. Um, and actually, this is quite an unusual image. You wouldn't actually see this um, if you walked into the room and used the torch because forensic torches um, often have quite a, a narrow, they quite, cast quite a narrow beam of light. So you'd never actually be able to see the entire piece of artwork. You would have to, like a forensic scientist, really search the space and uh, kind of jigsaw puzzle together traces that you'd seen in your mind to make a, a, a view in your mind of the whole, whole piece of work. Um, Acid Yellow 7 was also used to create this artwork, actually, uh, which is based on pa a painting by Caravaggio. Um, so Caravaggio, during his life, uh, had a bit of a run-in uh, with um, someone called Tomasoni. Um, so Caravaggio attempted to castrate his love rival, uh, who, who was Tomasoni, but instead accidentally nicked his femoral artery, uh, which killed him. And the blood spatter in this piece mimics the kind of marks that may be made when a femoral artery is bleeding. And this piece of artwork um, is based on a painting by Caravaggio. Um, so this is the Caravaggio painting, um, which depicts decaying fruit um, and reflects on our mortality um, in that way. The fruit is also symbolic of male fertility, which is why the attempted castration of Tomasoni also seemed to fit with this uh, piece, including blood spatter. Um, because of my interest in objects, I really like to make, make prints directly from them. I feel that printmaking um, can be actually a more direct and honest way of recording an object, perhaps even more so than photography, because the object itself has come directly into contact uh, with the paper itself or indeed whatever you're printing on. Uh, this piece is called Mother's Little Helpers and was installed at the Clear, decaying Clear Lake Hotel and sometimes brothel um, in London. Uh, for a series of exhibitions I co-curated with Olivia Hicks and your very own Laura Clark um, as part of our Rented by the Hour collaborative group. The wallpaper also emitted a burnt smell, uh, which only added to the kind of feeling of immersion and unease in the space. Um, printmaking, I feel, gives, gives objects a kind of agency, but it also... Um, is a bit like a fossil in some way. Um, prints capture a moment in time wh where there has been an impact. Um, this is from a series called Homing, which depicts the impact marks left behind from birds flying into windows, which I'm always on the lookout for, um, if anyone knows of any. Um, there is something both tragic actually and humorous um, in these images which highlight how human building has impacted nature. Um, so this is a series of bird impacts installed at Bowley Gallery in London as though a whole flock of birds had flown into the window as part of a kind of freak event. I think maybe at the time I was thinking about the Hitchcock film The Birds. This is um, an image of me installing um, that piece of work. I'm missing some work here. It's okay. Um, so often in my work, I'm trying to increase the longevity of things that are delicate um, or, and almost intangible or sometimes even invisible to the naked eye. I try to make prints that will stand the test of time. However, in this piece, uh, marks were made that intentionally disappear after 30 seconds. Uh, this piece was commissioned by Science Gallery for their blood exhibition and a substance used to detect blood called luminol um, is dripped down the figure which is actually a life-size figure cast in, in blood um, and actually the model I used for this um, had a genetic um, disorder called von Willebrand's 
um, which is when your blood doesn't clot very easily. Um, so I used her and cast her um, head and her body. Um, and the, the marks in this piece, um, unlike when I'm often trying to make, make a, a piece have more longevity, these marks disappear after 30 seconds, this luminol. It kind of glows this beautiful electric blue and then it will fade away. Um, and um, every, every streak, every time the luminol kind of streaked down the figure in the dark, it temporarily glows and the viewer has to retain this information in their mind to build up a mental picture of the shape of the object before the light fades. So the idea really was instead of a tangible print, I wanted the viewer to imprint these abstract forms on their memory to build up an idea of the shape of the figure beneath. So a kind of print left, left in your mind instead of on paper was the idea. Um, as well as an interest in domestic objects, my work often uses the body as inspiration. This is a shot from my open studio during a residency at uh, Coll Arts Lab, um, where art, uh, art materials are researched, tested and developed for, for, for art companies like Windsor & Newton, Liquitex and Conte à Paris. Um, so during this residency, my aim was to work with the chemists there in the lab to make a paint and resulting artwork using human ashes. But um, actually during, during the tests um, I was doing there, in which I was actually using animal ashes, I discovered that the lab's um, electric muller could be repurposed as a printing press. Um, this is something I'm often looking out for in different, uh, different moving mechanisms in life. An electric muller is um, used to grind and mix pigments with a base so that it makes up the paint or the ink. Um, and it consists of two circular glass flat surfaces that rotate um, over each other. And then the pigment and the base, um, which, you know, it could be linseed oil or whatever, is mixed with the ash and then that, that grinds together. Um, and I found it that they were making some really beautiful interesting patterns when I was lifting up the glass from each other these suction marks were occurring um, and I think I really liked that these marks were reminiscent of fingerprints um, and I like to imagine that they perhaps may be related to the indiv individuality of each animal um, and I also I think the main crux of this project really was that I wanted um, to encourage discourse about the taboo subject of death, which, you know, although it's getting better, we still don't really talk about death openly, um, perhaps as much as we should do. Um, so this is a more recent piece um, entitled, I Think I Lick You. Um, for this artwork, couples licked a sugar solution from the surface of metal etching plates. Um, a sugar lift basically, um, to make a series of etchings and then I layered the licks on top of each other to form kind of snogs or kisses um, and also they kind of form like a Venn diagram where the tongue sh shapes meet in the middle leaving a white overlap and this overlapping section could be seen as a kind of coming together of DNA aka a child. So I was quite heavily pregnant when I made this these series of prints. In recent years, I've actually found that collaboration or donation of visual data is becoming much more relevant to my practice. This usually involves collecting some kind of samples from many people um, in order to make a series of work or multiples. Inspiration for these methods is taken from citizen science projects um, or what they call a dragnet approach um, in forensics where fingerprints or swabs are taken from many, many people um, to search for an offender. Um, so I wanted to leave you with um, an ongoing project. This actually isn't a print. This is a piece of sculpture I've made. Um, but I'm looking to um, do some printing for this series of work. Um, so this is a series called Breakup, um, where I'm asking separated couples to donate an object that they have gifted to each other during their relationship and now or, or, the, or that the other one has left behind um, after their relationship has finished and then I go about destroying that object in some way so um, I've done a couple where I've burnt the object 
Um, and I suppose that comes from that idea that, you know, you know, in those um, in some silly rom coms, they have a moment where you might uh, destroy your ex lovers. Um, possessions by burning them or maybe cutting some of their wardrobe up um, in this case that's where I got the inspiration for this from so there's often a kind of destruction in order to create something in my artwork um, which I think runs alongside the kind of cutting and swabbing things in forensics as well um, but I wanted to leave you with this project just in case you know anybody um, would like to donate any objects uh, to add to this to this piece um, in which I'll be do, doing some more prints using uh, burnt ash in the future. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that. I think what I might do actually is there was um, a slide, if it's okay, if I've still got time, there was a slide missing, um, which I would like to just quickly show you. I think I've still got some time. Um, so I'm gonna go into my presentation folder here. Um, so, this, um, okay, so this is um, an artwork from a series called Entanglement, um, and this is a quite a large series of prints made directly from spider webs. Um, and I made these artworks when I was pregnant and I was trying to overcome my um, arachnophobia. And I thought this is a real challenge for me and this is one way that perhaps I could overcome it. Um, and also I was looking at Native American culture um, and the use of um, dream catchers and their symbolism in Native American culture, um, or the symbolism of spider webs as being protective over, over infants. Um, and I think, you know, I'd, I, I'd, I'd suffered a miscarriage and I think at the time I was trying to think about protection, way, modes of protection um, that I could offer to, to my baby. Um, uh, and I'm just going to show you this is that work installed at a gallery space. So I'm just going to go back to the presentation now and leave you with, with, that, with that final slide. Oh, I'll just switch, switch through them again. And then hopefully uh, there might be some questions maybe that people might like to ask. Excellent. Excellent. Hi, I hope I didn't rush through that. Sorry. <laughs> no, very, no, thank you very much. And, uh, well done for the improvisation skill at the end there. Yeah, I knew. I in as well. And uh, there's lots of, uh, there are really some questions. There's some, uh, some, some how questions. And I've started putting a how question in to start with. How do you record acid yellow ink? And how do you print from a spider web? That's uh, you know, there would be my sort of I knew, I knew, questions. I, I knew that one might. Yeah, I knew that one might come up. So, like, I've got, I've got probably two. I'm really, really open about my work and how it's made. But I've got, got probably two projects that I'm really secretive about, and one of them is the spider webs. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you hanging on that one. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the um. The other one is the um, ashes, uh, the human ashes artwork, but that that is actually because I don't even know myself um, because I, when I was working in the lab, because it's for an arts company, um, they wouldn't tell me what exactly I was mixing with the pigments to make it stop cracking, for example, on the paper. <laughs> so I don't know myself with that one. Um, uh, what was the question in, re in relation to Acid Yellow 7? Well, it's the. I mean, how, when you you said in your talk that you can that no, a normal visitor would not be able to see the acid yellow on the glasses and things um, without uh, goggles. Uh, how do you manage to record them photographically? Ah, uh, so um, I I was very I was I got the I literally got the goggles uh, that you put on your eyes and I put them over the lens of a camera. Um, and then I got multiple torches and sometimes actually forensics um, supply companies will sell something that is more like a floodlight rather than just a torch um, mm. that you can shine on the entire installation and then you get a view of the whole thing. But um, I, I intentionally quite like the idea that people had to really search the environment um, to, mm. to find the traces. Um, so I did that intentionally, but yeah, you, you, I just literally strapped the goggles to the to the yeah. camera. 
<laughs> so a simple, a simple but effective solution. Uh, yeah. Yes, really yeah. I, yeah. I think. Um, I mean, for me, it was a simple, effective solution. But um, but in in um, you know, a forensic lab would have a, a specialist mm. lens that they could use to photograph um, anything that they need to. Um, but at the time that I was photographing that, although I was working with forensic labs, um, I didn't. Ha I just didn't have access to it at the yeah. time. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had to yeah. I, improvise. Improvising is always a good thing. There's a yeah. question, I'm just going to read it out, a question from Sophie, which is, uh, what is the relationship between you, between the installations and the images you take of them? Do they become artworks in their own right, or are they a functional representation of the experience? That's a really good question, actually. I think it, I think it, because yeah, that's a really good question, because um, one thing I don't know about using all these forensic techniques is their longevity. Um, you know, I, I know for sure that, you know, the one of the football, the Depyridil um, dye has actually started to fade over the years um, because that's not what it's intended for. You know, the forensic scientists would take a photograph of the print and then they would have that on their, on their computer system usually. Um, so, um, sometimes, yes. So I would say in the case of the fruit bowl uh, with the blood spatter on it, um, that that is a series of prints that, uh, that um, I'm, I'm cu currently looking at making um, at the moment. Um, whereas I, I would say the kind of acid yellow seven in the, the image of the entire installation, I haven't done any prints of that. That is something I would just use um, to record that installation mm. yeah yeah okay. yeah uh, another question here from caroline black uh, how do you recreate the prints from the birds hitting glass or is that also a secret <laughs> no no that's not a secret so that is that is something hi carolyn um, that is something i'm still working on actually so the the prints that you can see in the images um are are digital photographs that i where i've photographed the images and then I've spent hours and hours laboriously take, taking out any kind of reflection, um, any kind of background information because it's it's very hard taking photographs of um, a very, very faint image on glass. Um, so initially when I started looking into this, I actually thought that the mark that was left behind by birds was grease, was like a grease imprint. So I did a lot of tests trying to um, dust the print with different fingerprint powders and um, what I actually discovered was that it's not the, the, the marks left behind aren't grease they're dust from the feathers of the birds which which is a lot more difficult to um, lift a print from um, so that's something I'm looking at at the moment and I'm currently looking at um, Different different kinds of adhe forensic adhesive tape that that you can lift things with, mm -hmm. um, but the problem often is is that you know people, including me, don't always clean their windows very well. So what, if you try to make a print from the surface, you're often printing up picking up so much other information um, from the surface of the glass that you can't even really see the bird imprint very well. Um, so that's why at the moment they're they're digital digital prints mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, and but that's something I'm definitely working on because I as I said in the talk I really like using unusual materials in the work and I like that real real direct nature of printmaking and for me at the moment the digital nature of that isn't as direct as I want it to be so I'll keep you posted on that one. <laughs> Well, and if anybody has any ideas or any 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 tips yeah, that can be done, sure yeah. we can we can sort of uh, we can pass these on possibly. Um, yeah, maybe the idea now to get Laura onto the stage as well, and I've got some more chat messages. I'm just going to try and get into those in a second. Uh, and we go back once. Um, right. So there's a. I missed, so uh, Caroline Wilkins also oh, says, I missed what the object in the burnt wallpaper is and what material material you use to print them. Sorry, could you repeat that again? Um, Caroline 
asks, uh, what is the object in the burnt wallpaper piece and what materials did you uh, use to paint them? Okay, yeah, so so literally that object is, is irons. So um, I collected all of the irons from around that hotel that, where the piece was installed. Um, and I used them to make burns on the on the surface of the paper and also almost burnt down my house at the same time. So be very careful, please, do, if you do, do any burnt artwork. Um, but yeah, it was literally just leaving the irons on the surface of the paper until until it burnt um, for um, so, quite a while. Mm. So you have to obviously have completed your risk assessment and uh, and all that beforehand. What sort of uh, ethics approvals do, do you need for your for, for working with with remains or how does this work in the forensics world and uh, you as a visiting artist? Yeah, it's so it's it's very difficult. I I had I had a lot of conversations with people um, prior to making that work. Bec um, because I was trying to, you know, just trying to get hold of human ashes is quite difficult. A, a lot of uh, crematoriums all around the UK have a, have a room where people have just never picked up the love, their loved one's ashes um, mm -hmm. and they store them all. And I contacted a lot of crematoriums at the time trying to see whether, you know, if they'd had anything that they'd had for 50 years that they would, would like to donate to me. But... Um, obviously, they couldn't do that, and I kind of knew that they wouldn't do that when I asked. But I feel like you've got to ask, otherwise you won't get. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in the end, I actually ended up using um, the ashes of a family member, which is my my great uncle, um, because it it just meant that I had to bypass um, all of that all of that red tape and paperwork, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Uh, Olivia, Lauren has just messaged, she's got her daughter with her, so she doesn't feel like she can ask a question, but I'm sure she can. And, and Olivia has a brilliant question, so we'd like to hear that. Please, Laura. <laughs> Where is Laura? There she is. Yeah, so Olivia's, Olivia's part of our um, collaborative and uh, she just asked a brilliant question. She said, uh, do you ever imagine characters that would have inhabited your crime scenes, like the Caravaggio image, um, or is it designed to be more ambiguous? I think, um, I, think I, really like, I really like to leave that part to the viewer. Um, I like to set the stage for imagination um, and imagining narratives, but I don't, I, I, the Caravaggio one's quite an unusual one where it, I, I, well, I suppose that's based on fact. It's not kind of fictional characters um, as much, but it is a known character. Um, yeah, I really like to leave that to the viewer um, mo most of the time. But that's something that I might um, look at in the future, actually, because um, I think with that Acid Yellow 7 piece, especially where it's a dinner table where people have been eating, that might be quite an interesting, you know, if you were to imagine a dinner conversation between to um two famous people and uh, that might be quite interesting um so so yeah it's definitely something that i i think about but i usually i usually leave out of the work yeah because i think with the caravaggio one i've not seen you do anything like that before where you kind of build you build a story or you're constructing a story for the viewer it is usually ambiguous and people they can form their own stories or it's just like wow what what has happened here i think that might be quite a an interesting avenue to explore where you're looking more at stories and yeah, definitely. yeah. i think i've always been um it's just in my nature that i've always, i i just i've always been more interested in facts than um than than fiction and i think i think and i think maybe that's why that for the Caravaggio, although there is a character involved there, um, you know, it's an event that is, was meant to have happened in real life. It's kind of in art history. So that's why um, that's why I, I feel like that's, it's kind of dipping my toe into it, but not fully, fully mm. subverting into the, into, the, um, into the narrative side of things. I think it's amazing though, that, that crossover between art and science, because both are attempting to like form some kind of understanding of the world so yeah. with artists you know you're, you're trying to understand something whether it's your own you know interests or your own thoughts or a trauma that's happened that you're trying to work through or 
you know just yeah. something that you're trying to understand and then with science it's the same you're trying to form some kind of understanding so i think kind of combining the two is really is really interesting yeah definitely yeah definitely i think it's i think it's getting a, it's getting a, a balance isn't it i i it's having for me it's leaving enough room for the viewer to have their own because there's nothing I like more, actually. The thing I really, really like, that my favorite reaction to my work is, um, because a lot of my work's to do with um, reappropriating something that's seen as disgust, uh, you know, vile or mundane. I, my favorite reaction is that someone might look at something and go, wow, that's, that looks beautiful. And then when they realize that, oh, it's a human gallstone or, or it's some blood spattered across an object, they kind of go, oh, oh, no. You know, I really like to change perception of, of, of materials. That's what I really um, aim to do. Um, and so um, I think I, I like to leave a lot of space for the viewer to have those feelings. And um, I think I think that's it's, it's getting the balance. Leave, you know, leaving just enough space for the viewer to have their own thoughts, but also giving them enough information. It's like, mm. it's a tricky yeah, thing to do. Yeah, I can I imagine that, uh, yeah, I can I can just see in my mind a sort of a film appearing, you know, from, with all the stories that you're giving us now and all the, all the mystiques and the secrets uh, that you're revealing there. So it could be quite nice to have as a, maybe as a moving image piece as well, possibly. Yeah, definitely. I think that's um, something that um, I regretted more with the Luma Trace piece, with the with the um, where the the streaks were streaking down the figure, the kind of glowed that blue colour. That I never. It, it's very because I'm not a natural photographer. Um, it's very difficult to it's very difficult to get that kind of you mm. know video from something like that, especially um, in such a difficult environment where you're in the pit a pitch black space. So, um, so yeah, that's always something I slightly regret from that piece of work, and that's something I need to get better at is is kind of recording things, perhaps in a moving image um, mm. way. Yeah. Well, there's scope yeah. for collaborations and everything. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you much. I don't. I'm just checking. There's uh, if there's any more Q and uh, questions um, that I would like to. Uh, to pose, or if you want to sort of just put something in the chat, um, I think I've got all, I've, I've covered everything I was asked so far. So, um, and we're sort of up in our time limit in a minute as well. So, just uh, enough, uh, <clears throat> this leaves, leaves it for me to say thank you to, again to, to, uh, to B to, and to Laura as well, mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, thank you for participating, everyone. Um, and just to say that our next uh, lunchtime seminar is then on the 23rd of June, and we will have a, a presentation from one of our members of the CFBI, Elisabetta, uh, who's a uh, recently joined member of the uh, research associate at the CFBR, who will be uh, talking to us about her, her past as a paper conservative working for Historic in England. So just to wrap up, to say thank you uh, again. <clears throat> as some Lots of, um, um, of of comments to say thank you um, for a really nice talk. Um, Catherine Greenwood says, say hi to Lauren B from Putney Print Room <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yes, so we're still open a bit. I'll, I'll, I'll stop the recording now just to say the recordings will be, the recording with your permission B will be on the CFPR website as well. So okay. anybody... To if that's okay with you and everyone want to join us next time, please uh, forward the um, the invites. And if anybody feels inspired to follow and also give a presentation on their work, please get in touch and we'll arrange a, a time for you to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. And Thank I will you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.